So we thought we'd talk a bit about myth busting around low back pain as a, a common presentation that, that comes through our service. People have come, kind of come with these various thoughts and experiences and uh, we thought we'd kind of pick people's brains on, on that really. Um, so kind of first one, maybe throw this at you Chris. So uh, what do people often say when you ask them what they think is causing their back pain? Oh, I mean, it, there's, there's lots of reasons, I think. Um, the common ones, I think, are, are things like people say, well, I've got, um, I've got spondylosis or I've got degenerative change or um, I've been told um, I've got uh, disc degeneration um, or I've got a slip disc. Um, all the, these are really common kind of the things that, that people say. And um, I think, you know, partly... Um, well, it's it's our job to explore those and, and their understanding of what those things actually mean mm. because they mean different things to different people. And I, I think from your point of view, you probably see yeah. similar sort of stuff. Yeah, I mean, and that's that's a really good question. What we do ask patients, what do you think is going on? Mm. Mm. And I think probably similar sort of answers to what Chris has discussed there. And, and I think probably 20 years ago, I think historically, when people did diagnose backs, it was all around sending for some sort of image. And then once you've got the image, you'd give a patient a diagnosis and often they wouldn't have much hope after that and they've held these beliefs for a long period of time. But I think what fascinates me, I think and I was a study what was done in I think it was twenty twelve where they imaged two thousand individuals who were asymptomatic and they didn't have any low back pain. And often these things what patients report like disc bulges, degeneration, spondylosis. They were finding that people who don't have any back pain had all very similar things. And then I think I think that was one of the things we thought actually, but what is driving the pain? So people with no um, with no symptoms of pain were scanned and it showed all these kind of different mm -hmm. things going on in their spines yeah. on the images, which yeah. sound quite scary, yeah. but actually these people have no pain. Yeah, totally. And I think, yeah, totally. And I think I'm not underpinning the role of imaging because obviously imaging is really important because mm -hmm. there is a small volume of patients where there is something sinister going on and they need to be imaged straight away and they need medical attention and we do have a small percentage of patients where there is a pathoanatomical diagnosis and they need imaging and then often they need the right sort of medical input but that only probably accounts for sort of like 10 to 15 percent of patients i think the rest of these patients have fallen into like what they call non-specific low back pain and i've, I've never used that term with a patient non-specific because it plays it down and probably what we talk about is multifactorial low back pain but yeah, imaging for those patients where there's, there's, there's nothing suggesting that the imaging is going to change the management, this probably can be detrimental for things like mm -hmm. yourself. Because if you're told those, that information, mm -hmm. what have you been told? You, you, you've, got, you've got a degenerative spine, I think I'm probably quite afraid of it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I think even in that, um, you know, that 10, 15% of people that you talked about, um, you know, the um, you're talking about kind of um, people who have maybe disc prolapses or something like that, which they'll get better anyway. Yeah. And, and you know, there's a, even, I suppose if you drill down on that, even there's a much tinier percentage of people within that that will have, you know, a, a spinal pathology that we'd be concerned about, you know, like an infection or, you know, something like that, or even a, a secondary or like a cancer or something like this. Yeah. It's, it's, you know, the reality is, it's as you say, it's so incredibly rare. And the majority of people with back pain, um, they will have, these changes are fairly normal changes, the changes that we get in the same way that we, I want to neurosurgeon say that it's a bit like wrinkles on your face. You know, we, we see changes in the spine as, as the years go past and these are just normal changes that occur. So, so if I'm kind of a patient, I've got, you know, debilitating back pain, it's really impacting my life, it's a real struggle and I'm thinking, God, I must need a scan, I need, I need to know what's going on, I need, I need to feel reassured there's nothing damaged in there like what how do you handle it when kind of people come in saying i think i need a scan i think number one is give them a good listening to i think that's the big thing because i think giving them a good listening to and then once you can sort of understand their pain a little bit better perhaps giving them an alternative explanation of why you're experiencing this pain and often when patients say they want a scan you ask them well, what would be different if i had a scan and they would say, well, I want to be playing with my grandchildren a little bit more. I'd want to be getting back to doing something in my life. And, and often they say, well, actually, I think you might be able to do that without the scan. Mm -hmm. So sometimes finding out more about what someone wants. Uh, yeah, what they want. So I think patient doesn't want, I think the patient doesn't, they say they want the scan, but when you dig deeper, 
they want to be managing the symptoms better. They want to be doing more as well. And reassured. Yeah. 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 And, and often if you listen to the patient, you develop that alliance. Often the majority of patients, when you can give them an, ex- an alternative ex- explanation why they're getting pain and they understand it, I find the majority of patients seem to sort of get on board. Yeah. Mm. And I think from the you know the biological point of view, if we think of like the biopsychosocial um, approach to pain or pain as a biopsychosocial entity, the biological bits, clearly these are things that we we don't really miss we don't really miss in a diagnosis of, of something and that's why I guess over the last 20 years there's been a lot of research focusing on how we can screen and how we yeah. can decide who does need imaging and who doesn't need imaging and there's various questions that are hugely um, sensitive for picking up pathology in, in, in backs without them necessarily needing to examine people you can ask questions mm. and um, people who have um, spinal red flags as they're called it means really that we just need to take a bit more notice on that may be that we need to do some blood tests um, or it may mean that we need to do an image of the mm. back but that's kind of I guess how we've evolved with the evidence base for who needs to be scanned because we know that when we go back 20 years and we image people with x-rays the yield from x-rays is incredibly low as you know it's good for looking at bones but it doesn't really um, pick up much to do with soft tissues and um, so the information that we get from an x-ray is pretty poor that's why we don't generally x-ray people and also there's a big dose of radiation for a pelvic or spinal x-ray because it's got to penetrate loads of thick bones so it's it's um, it's a big dose and so we've moved on to mr i think and that's a much higher yield in terms of information but we're selective about how we use that scan and you made a really important point Graham, about sometimes scanning people unnecessarily itself is dangerous yeah. because it you know can be interpreted or misinterpreted and, and uh, that can make people, you know, um, more fearful, and, and you know that's damaging. And I think, I think probably in this clinic, especially a lot of patients we see with persistent spinal pain, a lot of them have been imaged over the years. Mm. Yeah. And I think often the information they've been given, the enduring impact of that is massive. Mm. And I think, and I well, in what way? From a physio perspective, I think back pain. I think over the years we, when people have been told that the backs. Or they've interpreted that the back is damaged. They treat it as it was damaged. Mm. So when they sit, they hold the trunks really, mm. really stiff. When they mm. bend, they pull in the core muscles. Mm. They move really slowly. They check for the pain all the time. Mm. And often that's massively, massively provocative. Mm. I'd, I'd ask anyone to say, "Hey, you know what I mean? Bend your back and tense up." And even if you don't suffer with back pain, I bet you start doing that. So while well, you're going to start getting some pain, mm. and then I think that's about sort of creating what we call like safety learning. So teaching them an alternative way of doing this. Mm. And often that can be done when you do. So have you, have you seen this cool study? What was done in 2012 where it showed what's on your spine is really normal. Mm. And often that's like a massive relief to patients. No, we didn't know that. So having a different understanding of why things might feel as they feel and it not being equated with damage yeah. or your spine's damaged, that gives people a different story to tell themselves and then they can behave differently around yeah. around their spine and you like moving differently yeah. Yeah. thinking differently and, and feeling differently totally and, I, and I would, i'd say as physios we, it's not about saying this is the way you have to do it how many patients i see sat in front of me every day and they're sat upright and i said well, why are you doing that mm. the physios told me mm. how does it feel mm. it feels awful what feels mm. better what feels slumped mm. well how come you don't sit like that well i've been told it's dangerous mm. it's not that much it's not that that's how I say. When we look at people who haven't got back pain, they were all sit quite relaxed and yeah. chilled out, and the people with back pain. A bit now. <laughs> so yeah, and I think, and it's patients to know that, that, understand that, and I think the clinicians perhaps who've told patients that in the past that that's just where we were in healthcare or where we were as a profession, but we've moved on. Yeah. So in the past, I might have had the message: you've got a weak core, you need to strengthen yeah. it all up. And actually, you're saying something different. You're saying actually, see. What, what helps you best and you've noticed with people you work with they seem to do better when they're a bit more relaxed and slumped around their movement and posture yeah totally like I said it's asking them what feels better mm. that feels less pain sit like that mm. the mm. back is incredibly strong and robust you go to like third world countries where they, they don't see clinicians they don't go to seek healthcare when they get back problems and they're humping around the fields doing all sorts and the, the back's massively strong or we've seen like People with horrific road traffic accidents are the only part of the body what's sort of still there, you know, what's not been injured, often the back and the pelvis. Yeah. It's an incredibly strong structure. 
Mm-hmm. But over the years, we've created huge fear about mm-hmm. it because mm-hmm. I think it was just the leading cause of disability. I think you know, we, uh, we need to work hard as clinicians generally to, um, to not create these myths, don't we? I think you know, we, we talk about osteoarthritis and we say, you know, well, of course you'll be in pain because you've got osteoarthritis in your back. And again, it's, I was really uh, interested to, to read the study that you alluded to before about you know, the fact that all of these changes are normal. And we can expect um, we can expect these changes in people who don't have pain. We can expect them in people who have pain. So clearly, they're not the things that are the mm-hmm. discriminator as to whether you're going to get pain or not. Yeah. So we need to work harder things, clinicians. So if I think something we kind of commonly hear is, um, I've got this terrible back pain. You know, I, I'm not on the right drugs. I need I need to to come to the clinic. And I need to be on the right the right drugs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's really common, isn't it? And I think it's the same for. For lots of different types of pain, isn't it? That um, there's a medication out there. If we can just find it, it's a bit kind of like Cinderella, isn't it? You know, if we find the right shoe, then it'll be it'll be a lot better. And um, again, the evidence for um, the evidence for medicines generally in pain is really poor. You know, we know that um, in acute pain, um, anti-inflammatories and paracetamol um, generally are things that might help. Um, when pain becomes persistent and the mechanisms of, um, you know, of sensitization start to kick in, they're not hugely helpful. Neither are opioids in the long term. We know that opioids for surgical type of pain or for, again, for acute pain, if you've had an injury or something, they may be useful. But in chronic pain, we know the overwhelming evidence is that they're not particularly helpful for sensitization. Um, and the pain generally isn't responsive. So uh, or generally isn't very responsive to that, and often you develop tolerance and end up having to escalate. Um, the newer kind of take on drugs using uh, antidepressant drugs or epilepsy, not because you know either somebody's particularly got depression or has epilepsy. We know that they change the chemistry a bit in the nervous system, but they're really blunt tools. Mm-hmm. I think, and we're, we're talking about um, you know kind of fairly subtle changes in the nervous system sometimes. Um, and these drugs generally, um, they're not subtle, and they usually carry lots of side effects. So I think largely, um, you know, the, the old technology that we're using in medication, because there isn't really many new pain drugs at all that have come along in the last decade, um, our understanding of pain has come on loads, and so there are probably a lot more targets for drugs. But the old technology, it's just not particularly useful, and I think more and more studies are showing that now. So what's the best evidence for, for you know, low back pain? Where does the kind of way forwards lie, do we, do we think? Well, I think in terms of, well, obviously, like Chris alluded to, you know, the, the screening process happens first, isn't it, mm-hmm. where you exclude. And you never rule out a red flag to remain vigilant, but mm-hmm. excluding that type of stuff. But then I, I think it's, it's, it's this more of a, I don't know if it's pain, pain management approach, but helping pay patients understand pain better. And I think we've got a growing body of evidence that patients can understand pain. And by reducing, changing their beliefs around pain can often mm. reduce fear and often mm. reduce pain. I think, for me, I think it's often then perhaps looking at moving patterns, improving mm. patients' moving patterns, so they've developed these provocative ways of moving over the years and providing them alternative ways of, of moving, but often can be a little bit easier. What and, about, um, sorry? Yeah, no, go on. What about when people come in and say, you know, if I move, it hurts. I just, I just can't do anything. I move, it hurts. Yeah. How do we work with? There's, with someone with it? Again, there's, there's very. I mean, there's, um, there's examples. I think in, in all the pain conditions, um, there's a pain condition called complex regional pain syndrome where um, it's absolutely. I mean, I think a lot of a lot of pain conditions are hugely provocative and, and hugely difficult to, to, to move the area, particularly in COPS. It's it's. Um, we know from the evidence that's a real problem and so we often bring it right back down to things like imagine movements and it sounds weird to talk about this mm. but um we know that the brain kind of uncouples um the different processes that are necessary to make movements and to um, perceive things properly so when we have that situation it's so difficult to move even imagining a movement can sometimes start to rebuild some of the connections in the nervous system and then you go on from uh, from imagined movements into recognizing different postures and mm-hmm. uh, in CRPS, complex regional pain syndrome, we sometimes do something called laterality training where you 
get to recognize what's left and what's right mm. so it's kind of challenging the brain mm. i guess because we know the problem for persistent pain lies within the brain and, and how the the nervous system has changed and so we try and rebuild those mm. connections and retrain the brain mm. and we can do it really subtly and then you start to move on to more mm. graded mm. hazards which is that, that's yeah. really interesting that because i think that fits into sort of this this relaxation mm. and this what i don't know Grown body sort of evidence, but people using it more in pain management. Because, like Chris was saying, there, someone with back pain, just asking them to imagine bending your back, they tense up, the respiratory rate goes up, aut autonomic arousal, and it's perhaps give, changing how they respond to that mm. a little bit. So, mm. like introducing things like belly breathing, mm. slowing your breathing rate down, not only to, to, I suppose, take the focus away from the actual pain, but also changing what's actually our arousal levels mm -hmm. and I find that these going back to some really simple things like slowing breathing yeah. down yeah. can actually be hugely beneficial yeah. and I know there's the, like, things like mindfulness now and I know mm -hmm. that's what we use in our clinic here with patients and stuff like that and it's all about tapping back into that nervous system mm -hmm. rather than trying to change something to a structure what can't be changed. Mm -hmm. There's, and there's loads of evidence about polyvagal system, polyvagal theory about if you can slowly breathing down and a, and a, a longer out, out breath that kind of slows your vagus nerve and your vagus nerve is the nerve that's connected to kind of everything really mm. isn't it your heart rate and your brain and everything like that so that's like a quick win in terms of affecting the physiology so that then associate gradual movement with that safer kind of more relaxed body response people can then maybe start moving a little bit more again yeah. and pain's mm. not ringing the threat bells as much mm. maybe i think what's really good about that like, often that can give a bit of control yeah mm. and like chris i think you said in an earlier video when they're at home at three o'clock in the evening three o'clock at night and the pain's ramping up and i'm not there we've developed skills to make them more robust have more self-efficacy than they do themselves yeah. but these strategies are building up patients so box of tools to say, yeah, I can deal with this. Mm -hmm. The pain has been there for a long period of time. Unfortunately, we can't have flare-ups and stuff like that. But I think that's what And, and flare-ups don't uh -huh. mean, do they mean it's not working or like, you know, because people can feel quite despondent, can't they, when they need flare? Yeah. yeah. And I think, you know, we, our understanding of flares again has, has changed a lot on it. And, you know, sometimes we think if a flare happens or previously we may have thought if a flare happens, you know, that means there's something occurred structurally in the back, you know, either a disc has gone or, you know, slipped or something like this. And, you know, the reality is for the vast, vast majority of, of, uh, of, of flares, it's really just something that's occurred within our pain system that's just increased the volume control. It's mm -hmm. just made it louder. And um, so when we know that that's, you know, the situation, then we can use all the strategies that Graham's just mentioned. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we can start to, um, we can start to get better control of it. I think it's a it's a long long term process because at the end of the day, if the nervous system has changed over a long period of time to become so sensitised, it's not going to happen overnight to to kind of recalibrate the nervous system. That's the thing that gives me such hope. Mm -hmm. Really, when we're managing really difficult situations, really intense day to day pain, that there is hope to be able to recalibrate yeah. the nervous system. And and what I've heard is kind of it's about you know, us having some knowledge and understanding as clinicians, but also people having knowledge and understanding about themselves yeah. and us valuing that mm. and working together and, and then people are ultimately kind of empowered to yeah. to manage their own condition mm. kind of effectively. Yeah. One last myth before we finish. Um, I don't know if it's a myth or, or actually something people often come across really. People think I'm putting it on because my pain varies. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I think... You know, in lots of pain conditions, back pain is clearly one of them, but in lots of pain conditions, widespread pain, um, like, you know, maybe in fibromyalgia or something, there's a variance sometimes associated with that. And so people can go through periods of weeks or months where the pain is, you know, it's not quite as intense, it's still there, but it's a bit more manageable. And other times when it's absolutely, you know, it's, you know, it's really difficult to manage. And, and sometimes that can happen over a daily or weekly basis or even in the course of the day. And again, I think it largely, we go back to what we were talking about before, about how the nervous system can change. And sometimes when um, people reflect a little on pain, it may not always be the case, but sometimes there's, you can start to recognise triggers. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you talked before, Graham, about this really interesting concept when back pain is really problematic and people imagine movements, then it can flare pain. 
And so it kind of taps into how the nervous system is working. Yes. And, and so we know that flares generally are, um, you know, are a consequence of that. And so it boils down, I think, to people fully understanding pain and also partners and, and you know, families understanding these mechanisms as well. Mm. You know, because this is hard stuff, isn't it? Mm. Mm. But when people fully understand um, why you get flares, mm. then it makes it a lot easier to, to, to mm. manage.